Um, hello, everyone. Greetings from Central Coast. I'm excited today to present the work undertaken by 2019 University of New South Wales student from Master of Urban Development and Design and Master of Landscape Architecture programs. The program was run by Dr. Scott Horkin, my co-author, and his colleagues at the university and several industry subject matter experts. It was a great pleasure for me to be part of this program. I'd like to start my presentation today with the wicked problem that is faced at the local level by most local government in urban planning. As it is complex, requires long-term thinking and meeting the multiple priorities in the face of rapid population growth, meeting affordable housing needs, connectivity, improving livability and vibrancy, um, as well as providing the essential services such as waste, roads, and Central Coast is also a water authority. The councils also have to the local level deal with the political influence and drive the decision making um, whilst dealing with climate change and natural habits. So why do we need coastal resilience? IPCC's 2019 September special report on oceans um, estimated a likely increase of sea level rise by 2021. It's a medium confidence and that is expected to continue beyond 2100. In Australia, two thirds of the population reside in coastal cities, which equate to 15 million addresses across 544 LGAs. That increases the vulnerability of Australian communities that are on the coastal edges to flooding and tidal inundation in the future. According to the XDI 2019 report, um, coastal hazard risk and damages from this risk will increase by 111% by 2100. 2100 may seem a long, long time away, but it's it's the the impacts indicated um, are already being felt by what those spring tides and major storm events. The same report also ranked Central Coast as a fifth among the top 10 councils with high coastal hazard risks. To Central Coast, it is a tourist destination. It's a beautiful part of New South Wales, well known for its beaches, surfing, bushwalks, um, and if you're driving from Sydney on Friday afternoon, you realize how many people are holidaying on the coast. Um, however, it has the two sides of, there's two sides to everything. Um, just over the last two years, the region has suffered from major natural disaster events, starting with severe drought that threatened the water support for the region. Um, the farmers were really um, suffering and caused, uh, as a result of this massive drought, they caused the 9-2019-2020 uh, catastrophic bushfire events that burned 21 million hectares of land. Early 2020, there was a dramatic shift in the weather and the intense rain brought flooding across the coast. Then COVID took the centre stage, followed by June storms and uh, coastal erosion events, which was also declared disaster, as a number of houses were at the brink of collapsing into the ocean. Central Coast region, where it is, it's in um, uh, in between Sydney and Newcastle, approximately 80 kilometres from Sydney and 90 kilometres from Newcastle. It is one of the largest uh, uh, regional councils. Um, and the region faces some immediate challenges, such as increasing population. In fact, we are running out of land for, to meet the housing demand. The demand for housing and employment, uh, and more than 40% of the community are commuters, which is eased due to COVID, as people are not working from. Um, offices and the option of working from homes become more viable. Due to the geography of the area and terrains and valleys that are either flood prone or um, bushfire prone, um, there's connectivity issues uh, across the region and, and hence we have a very high car dependency. Approximately 73% of the region is wooded um, and there are many threatened habitats, flora and fauna, as well as uh, high bushfire risks. 95% of the residential properties across the region are located in the coastal fringes, and some of these areas are already at risk from flooding and inundation. The region also faces some major economic, socioeconomic challenges, such as it has high percentage of aging population, approximately 27%, and a high percentage of low socioeconomic population. And as a result of COVID, we've also had a lot of unemployment issues uh, arising. Um, in the program, the five coastal communities were studied and they lie in the south of the region, the Brisbane water catchment. 
And these are Gosford, Arana, Saratoga, Woiwoi and Booker Bay on the peninsula. According to the Brisbane Water Risk Management Plan and study, approximately 6,100 properties, uh, which is almost 90% of the properties, at risk from inundation in a 100-year event. And this would further be exacerbated uh, if um, combined with the sea level rise. Already the drainage system kilometers away from shoreline have salt water at high tides and salt water plant plants growing along them. The coastal studio um, that was undertaken by the program um, focused on um, the problem solving learning where the students were divided into five groups, each focusing on one case study. And three scenarios were de developed for each of the um, communities. Each community faced multifaceted challenges besides flooding and salt water uh, intrusion, such as connectivity, aging infrastructure, environmental issues, economic and social um, challenges. Good example is the, represented by the uh, top picture in Atlong Bay, there is sand banking, uh, which impacts the ferry movement. And the second picture talks about, demonstrates a low-lying drainage system and hence tidal water travels up the system. Um, and um, the critically endangered species and um, the inund tidal inundation and high tides and king tides across these communities. So I'd like to talk about the, um, uh, do a comparison between scenario planning and traditional planning. My observation, predominantly planning uh, at local government level, um, traditionally is solution driven, solution based. It's a linear approach, meeting the current needs uh, or urgent needs and subject to the um, mostly the political climate, the political decision making, whatever the drivers are. For instance, meeting the housing needs um, and creating a high density residential area with without consideration for changing climate or even availability of amenities or transport connectivity. So creating planned ghettos. This issue was also highlighted in last year's same event by a number of different presenters. Um, as I mentioned, the agenda is always usually politically driven. For example, the establishment of the Arana Center in Central Coast that sucked the life out of the Gosford CBD. And many examples of silos and short-sightedness short as many initiatives are either grant-funded uh, that dictate the deliverables and hence lack of broader considerations such as sustainability and climate change as they are usually seen as costing the business or hindrance. The land release areas are identified, for instance, um, to meet the housing needs. The infrastructure seems to be an aftermath, which should be the other way around. In comparison, scenario-based planning uh, is not a new concept. It, um, it, it is, it's a very old concept, in fact. However, its application on evidence-based planning is refreshing, as it allows layers of thinking insights to be factored into the design planning. This thinking is consistent with place-based planning, supports the biophilic approaches to understanding the area, its geography, its vulnerability now and into the future. Its current solutions, um, social issues, and forecasting the pot potential future changes that needs to be realized now. For instance, when planning for 100 year infrastructure, you really need to start factoring in the um, sea level rise into your design planning. There were four steps to the process for scenario planning um, that was um, applied to all the five uh, communities in the studio lab. And I'd like to present um, two of the case studies, one in detail and one briefly. Whilst the same methodology was applied for by each group, the thinking and analytics for each case varied vastly. And this highlights the essence of different lens that we bring into the planning realm and why an integrated approach to becoming more is becoming more favorable as we move into the uncertain future. Um, so the first case, uh, the community that I'd like to talk about is Saratoga. Um, Saratoga um, is a very densely populated low-lying area that floods at least twice a year during king tides and major storm events, um, which equates to 0.2 meters of uh, sea level rise. At high tides, the salt water travels through the drainage system on, and on streets, and, uh, um, which causes damage to vehicles and infrastructure. Due to the geography of the area, it only has one access road, which highlights challenges if the place had to be evacuated ever. In step one, to understand 
and the various data sets were spatially mapped and analyzed that include typology, geology, build form, flooding analysis, and environmental issues. The different flooding vulnerabilities were also considered, and the analysis indicated that the number of properties at risk in fit with the type of flooding event. For instance, uh, 1,600 properties at risk, risk in a one-year one year event, which increased to 3,800 properties in a 100-year event. And if the 100-year event is combined with sea level rise of, say, 29 meters, the number of properties at risk increased to 5,300 properties. The second step involved uh, developing the resilience framework and strategies for the um, study area. The resilience framework that informed the development of the three strategies focused on transportation, checking the environmental values and creating safe livable places, which involved identifying housing opportunities for those at higher risks and identifying properties that needed to be retreated. Um, this also included traffic, land use, recreational values, and environmental analysis to inform the three strategies. Step three was the development of the scenarios. And the three different scenarios were developed, adaptable land, energetic loop, and green barrier. The first strategy, the adaptable land, um, used the scenario to avoid end retreat, which meant retreating all the properties, 372 of them, from the high hazard prone area in the diagram um, shaded by blue and moving into the um, light orange and yellow shaded shadings uh, represented by the arrows. The second strategy considered some landfall modifications to adapt while improving connectivity and re um, recreation options and minimizing the number of properties to be retreated, which was uh, which decreased to 73 properties uh, only. And the third strategy um, considered no retreat option, rather adapt and protect the area using a green barrier created by biosystems, such as bioswells, grain gardens, and urban wetlands. Each of the three scenarios were then subject to further screening um, and compared to identify the most feasible solution for the area. This involved scoring each strategy against four criteria, economic feasibility, capacity to construct the landform, modification proposed, uh, retreat rate, and flood resistance. Likewise, um, I'd like to just take you through the Woiwei community outcome. The three strategies de developed in this case were very interesting. Woiwei, as you know, is built on a low-lying sand dune with high water table and faces aerial nuisance flooding. 72 hours of rain will, in, in fact, result in water on the streets, which is um, combined overland flow and salt water, as there's no capacity to drain the water into the ocean or to infil infiltrate into the ground. The landscape for, of Oewe is highly vulnerable to inundation from sea level rise. Three strategies using different scenarios were developed for Oewe, the fort, the green jacket, and the amphibious living. The fort proposed elevation of the train line because it is one of the most important um, uh, hub, transport hub. Construction of a network of open um, green spaces in the area that are subject to nuisance flooding and um, zoning changes to accommodate medium density around the train station. The Green Jacket proposed construction of a green barrier to mitigate flooding um, around the uh, high flood areas. And the last one proposed much bolder options of rezoning changes and creating a living in water. So in conclusion, um, I, what I might personal observation of the approach they undertaken demonstrate how different thinking can be driven um, uh, into identifying urban resilient solutions and urban designs, which help you understand which mechanisms, which um, strategies can work in the future. Um, scenario planning for coastal resilience is in fact um, innovative and holistic and proactive and embeds a long-term approach to planning and urban design. It demonstrates that um, um, this approach of planning and urban design can also be applied broadly. It doesn't just have to be in coastal resilience context. As discussed, this approach allows students to in investigate multifaceted complex issues uh, for each community. It helps them deepen their understanding of climate change impacts and help identify design solutions to address these impacts. An integrated approach to planning and urban design brings all the disciplines together and allows consideration for unforeseen opportunities that were not realized previously. 
The scenario-based planning also demonstrates the usefulness of data, even if it is historical, as it builds on and finds new uses of the current data. More importantly, this approach can free up confrontation, debate, and discussions over contentious and div dis divisive issues as community will be involved developing the visions and strategies for their area. For instance, um, when former Gosford Council undertook the Brisbane Water Study, the study finding caused outrage and anger in the community as it created fear around loss of property values. Hence, Council chose to avoid confrontation, but as a result of this, the community did not have the opportunity to participate in the decision making for their livelihood. The point is, does the Council have to, how does the Council have these conversations or bring the community along the journey and avoid these confrontations? The scenario planning, in my opinion, is an imaginative approach to planning and designing uh, visualizes what does not exist, the, the creative vision of the future, and hence this approach will provide an interactive medium to work with the community closely to design for their future needs. Thank you.